Right. It's about nine o'clock. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Dr. DJ Brazier. Uh, I think I met a handful of you at least yesterday at the um, pre-college meeting, um, and I also uh, know a few of you from other classes as well. Um, those of you that are CMU students, um, I want to welcome everybody to uh, Molecules to Mind for this summer session. Oh, uh, <laughs> it says spring on that. Sorry, I didn't update that when I changed from last spring. Everything else is up to date, though, I hope. Um, so, uh, so this course is designed to be a, an introduction to neuroscience. Um, a couple of the quotes that I have up on top just emphasize for me two of the key uh, goals that I have with this course. Um, while there are a lot of things that you, um, that you do need to memorize and that there's uh, no way to get around that, um, I do recognize that a lot of information is available to you and you could always look up the Nernst equation or you could always look up um, uh, what, you know, what the concentrations of sodium inside versus outside a neuron are or whatever. Um, and, uh, and so, um, while there are things that you do have to memorize, my goal is not to, um, to force you to memorize unnecessarily, um, but rather to think critically about scientific processes and, uh, and neurobiology and, in particular, neurobiology research. Um, and so um, a, a significant portion of this course is going to involve discussing data that's been published in scientific journals and um, and helping you to understand the methods behind it as much as is necessary so that we can um, discuss and evaluate and compare some of the results um, between different studies. Um, in addition to that, even when we're not talking about scientific literature and scientific studies in particular, um, I am um, much more interested in um, encouraging all of you to think um, about the material, think about the relationships between the material in this class and other classes as well as the material between units in this class um, and how they all connect up and are, um, and are uh, hopefully um, sort of relevant to um, other things that, uh, that you learn in other situations and so on. Uh, and so there's, um, and, 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 and so uh, I, in the first sentence of the course description, I describe this as a depth first approach to understanding neuroscience. Um, there is a textbook that um, is strongly recommended slash required um, called Neuroscience Exploring the Brain. Um, apparently, uh, when I communicated that to the bookstore, I didn't quite communicate that correctly because they don't have copies of it. Um, but if you go down the elevators over there, uh, and you come out of the um, uh, right, come out at the fourth floor. Just on your left, as you exit the elevators from the fourth floor, is um, is the uh, science and engineering library. And there's a copy of both these books um, on reserve there. So you just go to the front desk and say you want um, you want the reserve copy. It's Hopefully under my name, but every once in a while it's not. But if you have that title with you, then they'll definitely be able to find it. If that doesn't work, then something's gone really wrong, and I need to go yell at the library about that. Um, I'm in the process of trying to work with the bookstore, but for now, probably you'll just end up having to um, order the book on Amazon. Um, you may be able to succeed in this course while sharing it with somebody else. Um, it's uh, you know sort of up to you. Um, in addition to all of that, um, I have course notes that I um, that I put out after each lecture. Um, uh, occasionally I run like a day behind, so maybe after two lectures. Um, and those are designed also to give you the highlights, and it's what I've written as the highlights of the material in this course. Um, and so between all of those resources, hopefully you'll be able to find what you want. Um, Actually, in addition to that, um, I should mention um, back there there's a camera right now and you have all this little slip of paper about filming. Um, the, the, um, I'm going to be making the, the, the videos of the lecture available um, unless I start to see attendance drop off and then I'll start sending emails like, hey, everyone needs to come back or else I might have to stop doing the lecture, uh, <coughs> making the lectures available. Um, because a good portion of what we do is, um, is in class activities and I don't want you all to miss out on that just because you have access to um, video recordings. Um, I still strongly encourage you to take notes in class because having your Hand move while you're while you're doing this is um, is very valuable for your for your ability to retain the information. But if you miss a little something, then you'll be able to catch it back up. Uh, any questions just about that sort of general overview? Yeah, sure. Is the book online? 
No, the textbook, not that I'm aware of. There are electronic copies available. There's a service that I know of called Course Smart, and I don't remember whether it's, I think it's C-O-U-R-S-E-S-M-A-R-T, um, or they may string it together and they may sort of lose an E and an S somewhere in there. Um, there are other places, and those, and those are actually available for, for cheaper. Um, Amazon probably also has a version, maybe not the fifth edition, but um, as I was mentioning to a couple of people beforehand, um, I actually have still sitting on my desk the fourth edition. Um, and, uh, and so if, you, if that's the one you get, then that should be fine. Um, was there another? Oh, sorry, did you have a follow-up to that? Okay, was there another question? I was just asking if the fourth edition was on. Yeah, the fourth edition is fine for the book. Yeah, um, uh, it's, and most of the slides that you'll see actually pulled from the fourth edition because this has only been out for a couple of months. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so I'd also like to introduce everybody to um, our two teaching assistants, Megan Bartoshuk back there, and then uh, next to her is Amanda Kuhn. Um, Megan's going to be here for, um, for pretty much the, the whole semester um, and, uh, and um, just finished taking this course with me this past spring. Um, and Amanda, uh, uh, I don't think, did you ever take molecules to mind with me? No, Amanda's taken several other of my classes and knows, and knows all of the material because uh, um, I, I used to teach an upper division class and, and a lot of that material ends up getting covered in this one. Um, but uh, but um, both of them, uh, have, and Amanda's a neuroscience major and has a lot of background um, in upper division courses that cover a lot of the same material. Um, and so both of them are great resources to you. Um, and they don't have um, set office hours. Um, they are going to be available, um, especially leading up to exams. Um, and, um, and also, along the same lines, um, my email address is, of course, also on the syllabus as well as my phone number. Um, I'm going to be in my office um, uh, Tuesdays and Fridays from 2 to 3. Um, that's time set aside every week to be available to everybody. Um, please come by during those times, or um, if those times don't work, then just send me an email. And um, aside from my other class, which I teach from 3.30 to 5, I, um, I can make myself available at other times during the week. Uh, and I strongly, strongly encourage you, especially because this is such a fast-paced summer course, to, um, to not hesitate to contact me. Um, we cover in this class, in three class periods, um, what in, during, during the academic year is a week and a half. So if, you, if something's not making sense to you and you wait three days, you're already almost two weeks behind uh, in, in the material. Um, that's, not designed, that's not intended to scare you. It may sound scary, but it's not intended to scare you. It's just intended to encourage you to, um, to not hesitate to let me know as soon as things aren't making sense. Or if for some reason you're scared to talk to me or you just um, are more comfortable talking with uh, somebody who's a student, um, Amanda and, and Megan are both available as well um, to, to discuss those with you. Any questions about that stuff? Okay. Um, so there's, there are a few specific learning objectives on the second page as well as... Um, uh, as well as various points uh, and suggestions for, um, for success in the course. Um, reading the readings, um, especially reading them before the class, can be very valuable because it gives you um, a sense of what's coming up. A lot of times we'll actually have some homework assignments that relate to the material that we are about to cover in class, and that's to encourage you to come in ready. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, the, this... Uh, these, these pre-homework assignments um, are a way to sort of help guide your reading because the textbook in a chapter can cover a lot more information than, uh, than we actually discuss in class or that you're responsible for um, and, uh, and, we'll, uh, and, and, so, and so that's sort of guiding you toward what are some of the key things to focus on. Um, and also, um, please, you know, pay attention, ask questions, speak up in class, share your thoughts about the material. Uh, there are only uh, 16 or 17 people registered in the class, so, um, so please don't be shy about that. Um, actually, that reminds me of one other thing about the videos, um, which is just because of some legal issues. Um, so what I'm going to do with the videos, the raw videos will be made available to, to all of you, as long as everyone keeps coming to class. Um, but... Um, 
we may um, eventually sort of process and edit those um, for further distribution, um, but we, we have to actually mute out your voices when you ask questions, um, and I may either just like replace that with like student question, blah, 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 or whatever, um, just for sort of privacy uh, requirements. Um, yeah, any, oh, and also one other note in here is, um, so we're in class seven and a half hours, you should be, in addition to that, um, spending, uh, I think, I think actually that this should be, that should be like 15 hours or so outside of class um, every week. Um, so, uh, so on average, you should be spending three hours a day on this class, not counting the time that we're here. Um, these first couple class periods as we're sort of ramping up, it's not probably not likely to be quite that much. Um, you can read ahead in the first few chapters of the neuroscience book um, or in um, the Fixing My Gaze book, which is not as intense a sort of technical read. It's more of a, it's more of a narrative, um, but we're going to have discussion about that midway through the semester, um, but you can go ahead and get started on that um, as you're, as you're uh, doing things right now. Um, but you should um, expect to be spending a fair amount of time outside of class every day reviewing what we went over and preparing yourself for the next class period. And some weeks it'll be, or some days it'll be closer to to one and a half or two hours, and then as exams and projects and so on are due, then more, uh, more time. <clears throat> um, the next page is uh, often what people are most um, uh, interested in, which is um, how you will be graded in this course. Um, so 70% total of your grade um, comes from, uh, comes from um, is that adding up to 100? I don't know. Uh, some things, yeah. Is that adding up to 100? I can't do math right now. Okay, good. All right, good. I can do math. Great. Um, so 70% of your grade is, is coursework, uh, is, sorry, is exams, um, and then the remaining 30% um, is, um, is a written report that accounts for 10%, 15%-ish is, um, is homework, and then there's 6% of your grade, um, which is, um, so during the academic year, we have four exams, but during the summer that would mean an exam every single week, which is just a pace that, um, that I didn't think was, was really reasonable. So instead of that, um, we're going to have um, take-home quizzes uh, that are due, um, that, that you'll get um, after each unit of material, um, and then every other unit we have an exam that covers both of those units. Uh, and so those take-home quizzes um, are not as, uh, as high stakes as an exam, they're designed to help you um, prepare for the exam by seeing the kinds of questions that I will ask. In addition to that, you also will get a practice exam for every exam and um, a list of topics that you're responsible for. Um, and I think there's a quote down at the bottom of this about sort of like how um, how um, I, I value essentially long-term learning, and my goal is to have you have um, learn things that are um, that are going to be uh, things that that um, will be sort of available to you and beyond just you know learning for an exam. Um, but I am always happy to um, a answer questions that you may have. That's not meant to discourage you from asking me about what you're responsible for knowing on an exam. Um, there are guaranteed cutoffs in the past. Those have dropped just a little bit, um, maybe like uh, 89.5 and above ends up being a B, ended up being a B last semester. Um, and the C boundary dropped a little bit more last semester to like 68 or 67 and a half or something like that. Um, but those are pretty close to the cutoffs uh, you should expect. Um, and if you ever have concerns about where your grade stands, I'm also always happy to answer those. Um, and then there are notes about exams and midterms and regrades and so on, um, in-class activities. One other thing is uh, on, um, actually, it's, it, uh, probably later this week, um, I'll give out a little bit more detail about the final report that's due uh, at the end of the term. Um, that's worth 10% uh, of your course grade. Um, and for that, the basic idea is that you're going to choose your own primary research article and then write up a report about it. Okay, so what questions do people have about any of that so far? Okay, cool, great. Um, 
Other policies, I encourage you to read the policies about academic integrity, um, also about exam regrades, um, technology use. Um, don't use, don't have your phone out in class. Um, it's, uh, um, it, I am going to be assuming that you're texting or something and it just kind of makes me frustrated if that happens. Um, other things like if you have your laptop out to take notes, then that's fine. Um, I'm not in any, uh, I, I, I don't really, want to be policing your use of technology as long as it's not distracting to other students around you. Um, if you, uh, if you um, have a disability or, um, or you're not sure if you do or don't have a disability, then you can contact Disability Resources and they can discuss with you if you want to get um, a memo that they, put, that, they, um, that they write specifically for you, um, which just doesn't describe to me what, what disability you have, but does describe to me what accommodations are appropriate. Um, so, uh, so sometimes uh, extra time on exams or flexibility on deadlines or something like that. Um, and then the last point is, um, is one about classroom citizenship, um, which is um, kind of relates in a way to the technology point, which is that uh, you're, you're choosing to be here. All of you um, uh, have other options. There are, for every one of you, other courses that you could have taken. Um, and, uh, and so, um, the choice to be here is one that you've made, and by choosing to be here, I hope that you will um, that you will um, be attentive, um, be respectful to other students as as um, as they make comments in class. Um, and um, the flip side of that is that um, I try very hard to make this into a valuable use of your time, so that you're not. Um, bored while you're here. Um, if there are things that I can do to help make the class time a more valuable use of your time, um, then um, uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm thrilled to get any sort of um, constructive feedback that you may want to share. Um, even if you want to share something anonymously, that's fine. Um, and uh, and um, as the semester goes on, uh, if, uh, if you, know, you have questions about the material or anything like that, of course, I'm always happy to answer those as well. Um, any other questions about sort of general course structure, goals, anything like that? Okay. Um, so the, uh, I emailed everybody last night. Did, every, did, did anybody not get that email from me last evening, yesterday evening, about the Blackboard site? Okay, um, so if you haven't already gotten into the Blackboard site, you should do that soon. Um, uh, if you're taking uh, another class this summer, a lot of people are taking two, then you will, uh, your other class should also appear up there, um, or you can ask the instructor if they're using some other sort of, uh, of website if, they're, if that's not there. Um, the, uh, before every lecture, um, uh, I will post um, whatever PowerPoint slides I'm gonna use. Um, and then, uh, in, in, then, in addition to that, um, there are occasionally emails that I'll send out with announcements and reminders. Um, for key things like uh, deadlines coming up, I also um, uh, try to announce them in class, but, but being attentive to what you get from me is, is worth your time. Um, and, uh, and then also through Blackboard, I will post links to where you can um, to view, the, um, view the recordings of lectures if you want to go back. Uh, so then the rest of this outlines the, the material that we'll be covering. Um, so for the next week, we're going to be talking about um, the electrical communication that neurons make, um, how, uh, how neurons as individual units become excited, um, fire action potentials, and, um, and maintain their electrical gradients and, and use those electrical gradients as a source to, um, to respond to their environment. Um, one of the things that we're going to discuss a little bit today and tomorrow related to that is actually pain sensation in particular um, because there's uh, relatively recently, uh, there was a discovery about a particular um, type of ion channel that moves sodium across the membrane um, that plays a role in cellular excitability, which is what these things normally do, but particularly and, and, and sort of um, um, specifically in the context of pain. Um, so we'll be talking about that a little bit today and tomorrow um, as a sort of way to, to, to give you a context for what we're thinking about in terms of um, neuronal activity. The second unit is about um, 
mostly about um, the connections between neurons and how those connections can change with experience or with just um, specific patterns of activity between those two neurons. Uh, and in particular, um, how those changes are expressed at a cellular level. Uh, and I suppose I should have mentioned this earlier, but my, my overall goal for this class is to um, provide a biologist's perspective on neuroscience. Um, I'm trained primarily as a biologist, um, and I am uh, most interested in how neurons function um, and communicate with each other at sort of a small scale cellular level. Um, and so in order to do that, uh, my, my, my goal or my, my, my broad interest is to understand how this thing in here works um, and how the, the analogous things that all of you have in your heads work. Um, but uh, in order to get at that, at the level of individual neurons and at a sort of neurobiology level, um, a lot of what I draw on and what we'll be talking about when we talk about original research papers um, are research papers involving rodents and in some cases um, monkeys um, because those allow you to do um, uh, invasive sorts of experiments that are not ethical to do with humans um, and, uh, and that allows us to get a little bit more uh, of a biology view into what we're doing. Um, yeah, let me pause there. Any questions co or comments about any of any of the sort of first couple units? Um, okay, so then unit three is about language um, and um, and talking about uh, um, bird song as one example system as well as um, primates as another system to look at uh, and um, and um, some of the brain structures involved in this in the types of learning that go on with language. Um, I should point out that so. The quiz, the first quiz, um, I'm going to give that to you on Tuesday, and then you have to bring it back on Wednesday. Um, exam one uh, is in class on Tuesday the 12th, um, and then and again Tuesday the 19th, I'll give you a quiz that's going to be due on, uh, on Wednesday the 20th. So plan ahead on those evenings, um, and you're going to probably want to be studying for the quizzes beforehand so that you don't have to study and then take it all in one evening. Um, yeah, and so we'll be talking about language um, and some of the neurobiology of language. Um, unit four is about perception and also about um, kind of relating back to unit two in a sense, um, how, the, uh, how the reorganization of neural circuits can influence perception. Uh, and that is, on, so on the 19th, um, for the first half of the class period, we're going to have um, a discussion section where you'll be um, into, uh, in groups, uh, in small groups, and you will um, discuss, uh, discuss the book, um, not with me, but with either uh, Megan or Amanda. Um, and, then, uh, and then for the second half of the class period, we'll come back together and have a general recap of that. Um, Quiz two here only, only relates to the language material, so you're not going to have to do anything that night about stuff that you've, you just uh, discussed. Um, but that's where the Fixing My Gaze book comes into the class. Um, with that book, you are, um, uh, there, there are a few things in that book um, that we'll talk about in class during the sort of recap time um, that you'll need to know for the upcoming exam, and I will, um, I will make that as explicit as possible, what you're expected to know. Um, the, the specific details of the woman's autobiography and her childhood and so on and so forth are things that I think are um, great to read about because they provide a human context for what, you're, for, for what we're talking about with sensory systems. But I'm not going to be testing you on you know, what age she got her first surgery or you know, um, um, things like that. <clears throat> Um, and then on, soon after that, on the 20th, um, you'll have to think of a, uh, you'll have to find an original research paper that you want to do your own written report on, um, which is then going to be due on, uh, is an outline on the 28th of July, and then on Monday the 1st of August is when the written report is due. Um, and then uh, units five and six 
um, as well as a little bit of unit one, end up being more, a little more mathematical. Um, we're we're going to be talking about um, uh, some, some computational neuroscience core concepts, like um, encoding of information, what information actually means, and how we can quantify information, um, and, uh, and then also uh, motor control and decoding of information, how I can rec um, record activity from a monkey or even a human's brain and deduce from what their cortex, their motor cortex is doing, what sorts of arm movements they're intending to make. Um, and in fact, move, have a monkey or a person um, with electrodes implanted in their brain move robotic arms. Um, and what go in some of the, the, the mathematical considerations involved in that, um, and some statistical considerations as well. Um, so those get a little bit more mathematical. Um, especially in Unit 5, we're going to be doing a fair amount of, of calculations with logarithms. Um, so if you don't remember what a logarithm is, you'll have to look that back up. Um, aside from that, um, uh, the only math you'll need is things that you should know from um, sort of general algebra. Um, and then the, I've reprinted here, and on your copies you don't have this um, the thing about filming, but on the online version uh, it has the, the whole thing about filming added on the end. But I've just reprinted the core, um, what, what all the evaluation uh, metrics are. Um, and then on August the 5th, there's going to be um, a final exam. Uh, so, yeah. All right, so what questions do people have about any of that? Who's, um, have people gotten the Fixing My Gaze book? Did people get that at the bookstore? Okay. What about the other one? Who's gotten the other one yet? Hard copy? Just a couple people probably. Okay, yeah. So, so like I said, downstairs, down the elevators, and then immediately on your left as you exit the elevators is where you can find a reserved copy of that. And um, this afternoon... I will post on Blackboard um, some, uh, some summary of today, as well as some material that leads in a little bit to tomorrow. Any other, what other questions do people have? Okay, uh, oops. There we go, it should come up in a second. All right, um, so again, welcome to Molecules to Mind. I'm Dr. DJ Brazier. Um, and uh, like I, the, the, actually the first quote on the syllabus about critique and, um, and evaluation of scientific literature, um, one of the things that I do want to talk about a little bit today is the scientific process and how um, scientific process um, I feel is sort of oversimplified in a way that um, can, can often act as a little bit of a disservice um, to you. Uh, and one of my overarching goals for this class is to, uh, again, have you thinking about the scientific process. And so that's why the subtitle here reads Controversies and Advances. Um, in this course, especially in Unit 2, but also in a few other places throughout the semester, um, we will be talking about um, some different theories that have different pieces of data behind them and trying to um, understand if there is a single coherent model that we can build from all of these different pieces of data or if there are still things we don't know and our theories are good but maybe incomplete. Um, and one of the things that... that I struggle with with doing this is that I firmly believe that there are knowable scientific truths that we can reach um, and that um, and in particular that the way that we get there is in part through argumentation and analysis but that um, unlike um, literary analysis which I find really fascinating. Um, some of the, uh, I recently watched uh, a sort of short description of, of the book The Catcher in the Rye, which I didn't enjoy when I first read it, but then after reading this and rereading it, um, it was amazing to me um, the, the, um, the, the structure and symbolism that's in there. Um, but unlike um, literary analysis, um, empirical data and experimental data um, that are reproducible experiments that everybody can do um, are vital to scientific progress. 
Um, and arguments to be successful have to be grounded in data. Um, and that's one thing, um, especially in Unit 2, when we go really deep into a particular controversy that I hope that you'll be able to, um, to get from this class. And that even if there are pieces of data that, don't f that we don't fully have the ability to reconcile with our theories, um, there are, um, the, 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 the data are out there and we have the ability to use them um, and think about them. And that's the core of scientific progress. Um, and actually, this is that, that same critique quote. But um, so for today, for the next 45 minutes or, uh, or so, um, I would just want to talk about um, scientific progress and scientific method in general. Um, and then in particular, um, Phineas Gage and the frontal lobes. Um, and then actually, oh, I didn't update this from when I changed the site. Um, it's not, uh, we'll be talking about somatosensory processing. Um, HM and memory are gonna, uh, is going to have to wait for another week. Um, so, so, so this should have read somatosensory processing in pain. Um, so sorry about that. Um, and so here's the, the quote again. Um, Critique is not some peripheral feature of science, but rather is core to its practice. And without it, the construction of reliable knowledge would be impossible. There are actually two parallel points that the author was trying to make when he made this, this quote, um, and both of them, I think, are very, very, very profound. Um, the first is that in order for you as a student of science to understand um, and build for yourself reliable scientific knowledge, you need to be critically thinking about what you are learning about. Um, you need to be um, I believe, aware of and thinking about the data behind the theories that you're learning in order for you to have a, a reliable understanding of why we as a community of scientists believe the things that we do. Um, I wish that I could present to you the data behind every single piece of scientific uh, results that we would get to, but we'd never get past unit one if we did that. So there are some things that I sort of skip past. Um, but I'm... Um, but the, the, the experiments behind what we're talking about um, are, are, um, are the truth from which we draw the theories that we build in order, to, um, in order to conceptualize these things into a broader context and a broader theory. So that's sort of the first point, is about your, your learning of science, all of you. Um, the second is about science as an enterprise uh, itself. Um, so... Scientists um, are always critical of one another's work. Um, and in criticizing one another's work, we encourage each other to um, think about possible explanations that might have been missed the first time around and um, provide evidence to show that what we think is going on is really happening and that the possible explanations that we thought of the first time around um, are actually correct um, by, um, you know, maybe there's some, you know, I, I, I have an experiment to test between A and B, I rule out B, so I conclude that the answer is A, and I say, okay, I publish this result, A, that's the answer, that's what's going on. Um, but somebody else comes along and says, well, yeah, sure, B doesn't fit with your data, but there's another possibility, C, that might fit with your data, and this is why. And that forces then me, as a practicing scientist, to, to go back and test between A and C, something that may not have occurred to me. Um, and that helps us to build um, more and more robust and reliable theories um, that are uh, um, more and more um, uh, yeah, reliable and, 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 and likely to be um, really representative of the world that we live in. And, uh, and because that's so critical, um, I, I, it's, again, something that I do want to emphasize in this, uh, in this summer. Um, this is a, a figure that I grabbed out of another textbook um, a, couple, a couple years ago um, that describes the scientific method the way it's usually taught, that you make some observations, um, and from those observations you have some sort of informed hypothesis that you come to, uh, a, a, a guess about what might be going on in the world, um, some s sort of like uh, infantile theory, essentially, about um, how, how a bunch of different things might relate together in one core conceptual framework. 
So that's your hypothesis. Um, and then from that hypothesis, um, which is a, a sort of overall, you know, um, uh, idea that, that um, when two neuron, when the synapse between two neurons gets strengthened, it's because there is more chemical transmitter being released, for example, might be a hypothesis that you would start with. So from that, you make specific predictions. I predict that if I do experiment X and measure, and measure variable uh, Y, then I will see result Z. Um, and if your prediction, if, and then you do the experiment, and if what you actually observe matches the prediction that you made, then you say, okay, well, good. This is, this is now consistent with my hypothesis. And so I'm going back and I say, okay, well, I've got a little bit more support for that. Um, or maybe it's not. And then I either revise my hypothesis or revise um, some underlying assumptions, which are not pictured here, but um, that, that I made about how these experiments might be, uh, might, might be interpreted. Um, and then if over, over a series of many experiments um, these results hold out, then you, start, you stop calling your hypothesis a hypothesis and you start calling it a theory. Um, and, it, um, and that's sort of the point at which it becomes more widely accepted among a broader community of scientists. So that's sort of how things are normally taught. Um, but uh, about a year ago, I was in my, uh, my older son's preschool classroom and found, um, and found this uh, representation of the scientific method that I thought was, um, was, much more, um, uh, was much more accurately depicting what really goes on in the process of science. Um, and so they talk about um, researchers and people making observations. Um, they were trying to uh, understand things about just the sun and the moon. And one of the questions they had is, you know, can the, sun, can the moon be out during the day? Um, another question was like, you know, what is... Uh, um, what is, um, uh, uh, what's it like on other planets? Um, my son, I think, still thinks um, that, that Mars is hot. He knows Mars is further away from the Earth than, than uh, further away from the sun than the Earth, but he thinks it's hot because it's red, and therefore it has to be hot. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's fine, whatever. Like, it, uh, at some point, he'll figure, he'll figure it all out. Um, and what I love about what they were doing is they, they came up with ideas. They came up with reasons behind their ideas, and then... They, they argued and discussed, and, and, um, and um, right inside the, the core method here is, is this idea of debate and argument and critical analysis um, of what they're doing, what they're thinking, other ideas, um, before they go on to sort of write up some, some sort of documentation of times of day that they've seen the clouds or the sun or the moon or whatever. Um, and and I loved seeing that because it puts debate and argumentation right in the core of the method. All right, let's see. What questions or comments do people have about any of that sort of overall idea? Um, so yeah, so next topic is to talk about this guy, um, Phineas Gage. Um, who's, who's heard of Phineas Gage before? Okay, so let's see, we've got maybe five of you. Okay, good. So, so um, you'll have to bear with a little bit of the background that you probably already know um, about Phineas Gage um, for, for the sake of the rest of us. Um, so, uh, so this is actually the only uh, known photograph of Phineas Gage, and it was only discovered in somewhere around the 1980s, some, uh, some uh, elderly couple was looking through some family pictures and couldn't figure out where this was from. Um, and it turned out that, their, uh, that some of their ancestors had known Phineas Gage and somehow a picture of him got, uh, got put back through. And at the time, they didn't realize who it was until uh, they, they, started, uh, they started researching and asking people around and they figured out who that was. Um, so Phineas Gage is, is um, the most famous patient in the history of neuroscience, um, probably the most famous patient in the history of medicine itself. Um, and his story, so he was um, in his 20s, uh, and um, he was working as the foreman on this uh, railroad construction site. Um, and, uh, and on September 18th of 1848, so uh, you know, uh, well over 150 years ago now, 
um, he was working, and um, what they were doing that day, um, actually for, for sort of that month, was um, for the railroad, they were, they were blasting holes through a mountain to make a tunnel for the railroad. Um, and part of that job consisted of um, pouring a little bit of sand. Well, for, actually, first of all, uh, drilling a hole in the rock, um, dropping a stick of dynamite in, and then pouring some sand um, over the dynamite, and then using a metal rod to pack the the sand and dynamite down. Um, the sand's purpose was so that a spark didn't appear between the metal rod and the dynamite and ignite the dynamite. Um, and so something happened that day where he got a little distracted. Um, while, so he put the dynamite in, something distracted him, uh, and maybe somebody came over to ask him a question, and he forgot to put that sand in. Um, and so instead, uh, then he turned back to what he was doing and started pounding down, and a spark ignited. The dynamite exploded. And this metal rod, and this one that he's holding here is the actual metal rod that, went, that, 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 that did this. This metal rod came flying out, went through um, his, uh, I guess it would be the left side. So it went through the left side of his, uh, uh, underside of his face, kind of just missing his jawbone, um, and went straight up through his, um, um, behind his left eyeball, and went flying out the top of his head 30 feet and landed 30, 50 feet away. Um, and so that probably sounds like it should be the end of the story, um, but in fact, that was not. Um, so, he, uh, so he was unconscious, not surprising, um, and they put him on a cart to bring him back to town. Um, and about 15 minutes after the incident, um, he woke up on the cart and started talking with people. Um, he was in some pain, but, um, but, he was, uh, but he was still conscious. Um, he came to the doctor, and, um, and, the, and the doctor said, this is... I, I don't believe you that this happened. I don't know what this hole in your head is, but I don't believe that something literally went through your skull. You would not be here talking to me. Um, and then uh, he sort of had a little bit of a coughing fit, and the doctor reported that a teacup full of brain matter landed in, his, in the doctor's hand, um, at which point the doctor was like, oh, maybe that did happen. Um, and so... Um, and so uh, and actually, um, he got an infection, was in bed for um, a few months, sort of in and out of fevers. Um, and then uh, the whole time, everyone thinking that he was, there's no way he's going to survive this. Um, and then a couple months later, um, he just, we woke up, and he came downstairs, and he started talking to people again, and he was fine. And, from, and, and at that point, um, he was sort of normal uh, to most appearances at that point. Um, but the, um, the, the reason that, that he's of interest as a neuroscience uh, subject or neuro an, an unwitting subject to an experiment um, or a, a, you know, done, uh, nobody got his consent before they sent this thing through his head, um, the reason that he's of interest is because um, many reports after the event um, claim that his personality changed dramatically. Um, he went from being calm, polite, um, and, uh, and well-liked, and well-respected and responsible, somebody that you could count on to do the, the work that he was assigned on his job, um, that you could count on in your personal life to take care of things if you needed a hand with something, um, to being irresponsible and reckless, um, swearing a lot, um, and generally speaking, his um, friends and colleagues um, said um, that he was no longer the same person that he had been. Um, so, uh, and since, um, in, in more recent times, um, using um, both Phineas Gage's skull itself and a replica, oh, I guess it, I guess it went through above his jaw, anyway, um, using Phineas Gage's skull and a replica of, of, of it, um, 
uh, some neuroscientists, most notably um, somebody named Antonio Damasio, who wrote a book, um, um, part of which features Phineas Gage called Descartes' Air. Um, uh, Antonio Damasio reconstructed the likely path that this thing went through 150 years prior to when Damasio did this um, through Phineas Gage's brain. And um, it went through um, what's called the orbital frontal cortex, um, which is a part of the prefrontal cortex that's right near the eyes. Um, the, the, the tamping rod did destroy his left eye in the process of doing that. Um, and uh, and we know now from other th um, cases where people have had strokes that affect this brain area or, um, or motorcycle accidents or other things that affect and damage this brain area, that damage to the orbital frontal cortex um, often leads to impulsivity um, and lack of attention to detail, inability to keep one's life organized. Uh, and, so, um, and so it based both on the reconstruction through his skull and also on the symptoms that were reported, it's likely that that is what was damaged. <clears throat> um, and so, yeah, I guess let me pause there. Anyone have any questions or comments about this? Gage was lucky to be alive. Yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, the most, the most improbable thing about this is definitely that he'd survive this. Um, uh, I don't know how many people, how many uh, 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 people working on railroads in the course of history have forgotten to put the sand in and had the thing blast through their heads. It's not a job I would want to have. Um, poking dynamite with a metal rod does not sound like, like a great idea. Um, and, but, but he's definitely the only one that survived, and probably um, it, it, it's, it's, it's among the more improbable things that has ever happened on the history of this planet that he survived that in the first place. Um, he did actually, um, so, so, so he did, following this, um, he, he, he recovered the rod that had, that had, did, that had done this to him, um, and ended up, um, the only thing that he could do professionally was to um, work for P.T. Barnum um, following around uh, um, a sort of circus of oddities where he would show off himself with his rod. By then the skin had healed, so it wasn't like impaling, it wasn't like sticking through his head or anything. Um, but, uh, but he did um, sort of work for a traveling circus for most of the next decade. Um, and eventually, so he was about in his 20, 25, I think, when this happened to him. Um, eventually, uh, by about 12 years later, at age 37, um, he did, um, he did uh, die from it. Um, what happened, what killed him was not um, in the infection or the wound itself. Um, what killed him was um, epilepsy, severe um, worsening epilepsy that developed throughout his life. Um, and especially by the end, he was incapacitated from the epilepsy he was experiencing, um, which is a reasonably common consequence of, um, of uh, severe head trauma like he experienced. Um, there are, of course, numerous accounts of Phineas Gage. Actually, uh, there is um, a, a short YouTube playlist that I put together, um, uh, including a couple accounts of Phineas Gage and a song somebody wrote about him, um, which, uh, which I will send out to everybody to take a look at uh, if you want to. Um, so yeah, so this, that's sort of, uh, that's, that's um, what happened to him. Um, his, his skull remains on, um, on display at the Harvard, um, can never remember, the Harvard uh, uh, Warren Anatomical Museum. Um, it's, this is the way it used to be displayed many years ago with the tamping rod um, through it uh, in the path that it took uh, over 150 years ago. Um, more recently, the display looked like this um, with um, the top of his skull removed, and you can see the exit hole as well as some of the damage that was done as it passed through. Um, and then the tamping rod itself is adjacent to this exhibit of his skull. Um, and so, like I said, you know, we've, we've, we've um, learned now, you know, it's probably the orbital frontal cortex. We have reason to suspect that that sort of area would cause this sort of damage. Um, but the, the thing that I think is, is the most remarkable about Phineas Gage's story, with the possible exception of the fact that he survived it all, 
um, is, and the reason that we care and that this is always, like you take an intro neuroscience class, and those of you that have heard about it, probably first day of some other neuroscience class to talk about Phineas Gage. Um, the, the context behind Phineas Gage um, is that at the time, there was, there was a lot of debate about what the heck the brain is. And is, I mean, I think, I think everyone who's here believes that the brain is at least largely, if not entirely, responsible for who you are. And the physical processes that occur in your brain are um, a major um, or perhaps the sole determinant of your behavior, your thoughts, your perceptions, your actions, your personality. And in the 1850s, a lot of people, medical professionals included, thought that the brain played only a very minor role in perception and certainly damage to the brain could cause loss of a sense, for example. And that was sort of widely accepted. So, you know, your brain is sort of processing some information. Maybe, uh, you know, damage to your brain can cause lack of motor control. But personality was thought to be something that was, that was separate from the brain and, um, and a sort of immortal soul. Um, and while I don't think science has, has anything to say about whether or not there is an immortal soul, um, certainly from Phineas Gage and many other cases like him, we know that the physical events in your brain do affect your personality and your behavior um, in a way that people thought wasn't possible in the mid-1850s. Um, and... You know, of course, there were cases of brain decline. Um, uh, there were many sort of degenerative diseases. Uh, but this is one case where you can point to where on one day, this guy was kind, likable, gentle, calm, dependable. And then, um, and then after he recovered, he had a, a violent brain injury. And after he recovered from that violent brain injury, his personality was totally different. It's not some sort of degenerative process of, of, of sort of his, his, his spirit growing old or something like that. It's a physical event that changed his personality. Um, and that, especially having like a single case to point to, is very persuasive for shifting the discussion about, um, about the relationship between brain and personality. And that's why Phineas Gage is... Um, is really uh, such a core figure in, in the, the history of neuroscience. Any other questions or comments about that before we kind of move on to other things? <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, here I do have pain and touch. I updated this part of the slide. Um, so Pain and touch uh, is kind of the last thing that I wanted to talk about today. Um, who's seen or the movies or read the books of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo? Am I just like totally dating myself here? Okay, like very few people have. Um, so has anyone who's heard of it-ish? Okay, a few people have heard it. Okay, all right. So, so maybe it's not, all right. It, 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 at least it's not like Casablanca or something where I'm like really seeming old. Um, okay, so, um, so, so the books, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoos, this like, uh, it's like sort of governmental conspiracy, whatever thing um, that, that ends up going on. Um, and uh, in the stories, um, there is a character uh, who has something called congenital analgesia. Um, and uh, algesia refers to the ability to feel pain. So analgesia is an inability to fear, fear, feel pain. Um, congenital meaning that it's um, uh, either something early developmental and environmental or, um, or genetic or some combination of those, but it's, hap it's, 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 it's sort of throughout life. Um, they don't describe, in this case, the molecular mechanism behind his congenital analgesia. We'll talk next time about um, a particular um, set of a few families um, 
who have congenital analgesia that runs in their families. Um, but in the books um, and movie, um, his congenital analgesia sounds like you might sort of expect congenital analgesia to be like, I mean, so pain, great, no feeling pain. That sounds like a great deal, I'll take that. Um, and, and he's this sort of Superman where no matter how hard you punch him, no matter how much you knock him down, um, put him in a building and it explodes and he comes out bleeding but still coming after you. He's a sort of unstoppable force because of um, his inability to feel pain. Um, and... In fact, congenital analgesia, as we'll talk about next time, uh, is a real thing, but it is not something that results in you being some sort of unstoppable superhuman. Um, instead, what congenital analgesia universally results in is people being wheelchair-bound, dying young from infections, um, and, uh, and otherwise crippled. And the reason is... Um, you know, I sometimes get a little nervous and have a little bit of extra coffee today, which is part of the reason why I pace back and forth. But, um, but one of the reasons that, you know, I'm up here and I'm sort of walking back and forth, shifting my weight around, or even all of you sitting down there, you're sort of, you know, occasionally kind of cross your legs one way and cross your legs another way. Um, you kind of probably don't even notice it, but your body just has sort of like little ache. You know, your back feels a little funny, so you shift. Or, um, or you're standing up and, and you just sort of shift weight to one foot or the other because one leg's starting to sort of get tired out and sore. Um, and you don't even really think about it, but, but that's critical for your body to stay healthy. Um, as you stand or sit in a still posture for a long period of time, unless you've worked very hard to sort of put yourself into a comfortable posture and before you do it, um, you are putting strain on some of your joints all of the time. And your body communicates that to you by little aches that show up in your knee and things, and then you shift your posture and it's fine. If you didn't shift your posture, your knee would start to hurt more and more and more, and eventually you would start doing damage to your joints and even damage to your bones from this lack of responsiveness to these sensations that your body's trying to communicate. Um, in addition to that, you get a little cut. You realize you get a cut. Maybe you know you like kind of and put it in your mouth for a little bit. Actually, that sort of can disinfect it a little bit, although not as good as like actual disinfectants. Go wash your hand, whatever, and then you put on a Band-Aid, keep it from getting exposed to things, um, and you don't get an infection. Um, if you don't know that you've got a scratch because you didn't feel the pain, then it can get infected. And as it's getting infected, it hurts more and more, unless you've got this congenital analgesia, in which case it doesn't hurt more and more, and so you just walk around with this sort of worsening, growing infection, um, and until you see it, you don't really think to do anything about it, um, and so you can end up with, uh, with um, uh, sepsis, where you have infections that spread into your blood, which can be life-threatening. Um, and so that's why these people end up crippled from that. Um, and so pain, as we'll discuss again in a little bit more detail at the beginning of class next time, is critical to your health and survival. Um, and, and, um, and that's going to be kind of one of the, the core ideas that we'll be talking about um, over the next, uh, I guess really just into the next class period. Um, any questions, comments? Yeah. Well, I read an article about people with this condition a little while ago, and one of the parts of it they were talking about like young children that would get into accidents because they have this condition, like a little boy thought he was Superman, so he jumped off his roof. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually part of the other thing is, um, so one of the things that we'll talk about next class period is um, people with congenital analgesia generally have normal um, cognitive function, um, but actually some of the ones that, that were studied in the one article that we're going to be talking about um, were working as street performers, I believe in Pakistan is where the families were, um, and they would be doing these like things where they like stab their arm with some big metal rod or something just as like, as, like a way to attract crowds, sort of a, a modern day sort of P.T. Barnum circus thing. Um, and then one of them did, I don't know if it's the same boy or another one, but one of them did actually jump off a roof um, as part of a stunt for this, thinking that, like, you know, this is sort of immortal. Um, that's, 
not the, the more common way that they end up dying is through these sort of these infections and, and certainly end up crippled. But yeah, that, that does, that, that has happened. And there's also a story of a young girl that I'll, um, that I'll uh, try to find before class next time or else right after class next time um, who's, uh, who's in the U.S. Um, who has this, um, this uh, same condition and has to be just like exceedingly careful about everything she does. Um, because um, she's she's been educated about what's about what's going on and knows um, and knows sort of the critical aspects of this, but still doesn't have um, you know doesn't just th th doesn't get those signals. Yeah. Is that the girl that they talked about when she was little? She would like chew her hand and stuff so that it binded up. Yes, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that's part of her story. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll find I'll, I'll find that news article and put it up uh, on Blackboard either today or tomorrow. Um, yeah, other questions or comments about that? Um, okay, so, uh, so it's about 20 minutes left in class. Um, I've been talking for long enough for now, for at least a little while. Um, so what I want to do is um, spend maybe about the next two or three minutes um, and have you just um, on your own uh, Brainstorm a little bit. Um, write down. So th we're talking about here um, pain and touch. Um, write. Try and kind of think of different kinds of touch sensation. Or um, so. So you know, you've got your five sort of five senses, which is which is sort of. Um, crap, but whatever, um, the seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Um, and touching is actually um, a really complex sense that involves a lot of different things. Um, pain is quite distinct from touch. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that next time. So that's sort of one for free, um, one kind of touch. But try to come up with maybe, um, maybe two to four types of touch. Um, and we'll just have you know, a minute and a half to three minutes for everyone to do that on their own. Um, and then we'll, we'll have uh, more discussion of that after that. So I'll give everybody a minute or so to, to, to write down a few different kinds of touch. Okay, so probably you've gotten at least a couple down. Um, before we have a class-wide discussion, uh, I'd like everybody to find, sitting around them, um, two to three other students to form a total of a group of three or four students, um, and uh, introduce yourselves to each other. Um, a lot of you uh, probably don't know each other since a lot of you are here visiting um, from, from all over the country right now. Um, and then uh, once you've introduced yourselves, take out a fresh piece of paper, write down everybody's name on one side, um, and then um, on the opposite side, um, try to come up with a list collectively of four, maybe five different types of touch. Um, and then also try and um, group them together. Um, maybe how, clo how, um, how clo are they, are they long-lasting um, versus short-lasting types of touch? Are they pleasant versus unpleasant types of touch? Are they, um, you know, static versus changing, whatever. Try and like sort of think of um, different ways that you can subcategorize them or, e or even just adjectives to describe the different sort of possible ways they might, they might express themselves. Um, and then at the end of that, um, uh, you're going to, so at the end of class today, you're going to turn in this piece of paper with everyone's name on one side and the answers to this on the other side, um, and then make a second copy to take home because there's going to be a homework assignment to do collectively as a group um, regarding that, or you can just use your phone and snap a photo to make your list. Um, the reason that I have the answers on one side and the names on the other is because um, tomorrow at the beginning of class as we start discussing this a little bit more, I might um, put up some answers, but, um, but I won't have names attached to it. Um, so don't write anything obscene or whatever on, the, on one side of the, the sheet or anything. Um, so yeah, so anyway, we'll have maybe, um, let's say, four minutes to, to work through this, um, and then we'll come back um, as a whole class and discuss all of what you all have come up with. So um, just, just uh, so on the Blackboard website, and again, please, please email me if you have trouble accessing it, but um, on the Blackboard website, um, on the, along the left side of the site, there's something that says assignments, and if you go to that, then you will see on there um, 
uh, two things. One is the group homework assignment due tomorrow. So the assignment for tomorrow is to, um, is to actually track down from the textbook, which may mean that you all have to be going to the library, um, or from other resources, um, the sorts of uh, sensory, uh, sensory nerve endings that are involved in the different types of touch that your groups come up with, which is why you should make sure that you have a record of what you're about to turn in at the end of class here. Um, and then the other thing is due by Monday, um, just a survey of, um, I, just to give me a better sense of who everyone is in the class, what everyone's backgrounds are, and also, um, I mentioned before we're going to have discussion sections about fixing my gaze in a couple of weeks, and uh, some of those will be during the first half of class period. Others of those I'm going to try to schedule either um, at some time um, the day before, um, so that we can all, um, because that, that way we'll be able to have smaller discussion groups. Um, but anyway, um, so everyone maybe kind of turn your chairs around-ish back this way. Um, and <clears throat> um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so I, I, I think we'll just sort of start, start out right now. Um, uh, having people sh uh, volunteer different types of touch that your groups came up with. Um, so I'll put the free one up already, um, although we may even subdivide this further. Um, you certainly can, but we've already mentioned pain as one type of touch. Um, what other sorts of touch are there? Uh, sure, yeah. Tickling. Tickling, great, yeah, tickling. Um, yeah, tickling's an interesting one. Um, uh, did you all talk about like motor control and motor feedback a little bit with that? So what so what sorts of things did you did you think about with that? Talk about muscle contractions and how whether that technically counts as touch or whether that's just part of motor control. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So so um, yeah, actually, that's sort of another type is um, muscle muscle awareness. Um, um, the technical term for this is proprioception. Um, with tickling, tickling kind of interesting because, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite ticklish, but this doesn't get me laughing. Um, and, uh, and so um, the, the reason is that I, that I know it's coming, but even more than that, um, uh, like if somebody else does it, even if I know it's coming, it still, does, it still gets me laughing because my, my like, spinal cord doesn't quite know it's coming, even if something up here knows it's coming. And it's sort of, it's sort of interesting to me. It's like, the, like visual illusions where I know, like I know that these two things um, are the same length, but I still perceive them as different lengths, even though I know they're the same length. I just drew them the same length, and then I put the airheads on, and, then I, and all of a sudden I perceive them as different lengths. And, um, and it's... Um, uh, that sort of thing uh, is, is sort of amazing to me to think about. That there's like stuff going on that I can know, but I don't know the right part of my brain doesn't know. But anyway, um, uh, were there other groups? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, heat or like that temperature? Yeah, temperature. Um, other, sure. Texture? Texture, yeah, yeah, that's a nice one. Um, Uh, anything else? Maybe from the some people from the back out there. Sure, yeah. Pressure. Pressure, yeah. So. Um, other anybody else? Any others? Sure, yeah. Numbing. Numbing. Oh, interesting. Sort of the absence of sensation. Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting one. But you do have a very distinct. Like when I go to the dentist, my jaw sort of feels like it's fallen off. Yeah. Human contact, yeah. So I mean, that may relate to to tickling, but um, one of the um, uh, one of the the professors here, who's um, who actually studies somatic sensation in her research, um, is interested in pain uh, in some some aspects of what she studies, and talks about pain um, as something that is basically impossible to feel without some sort of emotion surrounding it, right? Pain hurts. It's bad. The sensation and the emotion are so intimately connected in pain. Um, and while 
unexpected or unwelcome human contact can be aversive. Generally speaking, um, sort of light touch um, has a sort of calming feeling um, that it that it creates, um, and um, and um, and that creates a feeling of safeness of having somebody around that is um, that is sort of keeping keeping you safe. Um, and so, human contact she often mentions as. Some, in some sense, kind of opposite of pain, where there's um, there's there's also this sort of um, almost inseparable, not quite as inseparable as with pain, emotional context that it necessarily carries with it. Um, yeah, other other question, other ideas, other types of sensation. Um, are there any? Um, so are there any um, particular uh, um, things from up here on this list that have um, specific adjectives or categorizations that, that, in, that any of the groups put them in? Yeah, sure. We did a sort of scale from pleasant to unpleasant. Okay, uh-huh. So what sorts of things are more on the pleasant side? Uh, towards like genuinely pleasant was human contact. Either or was temperature. Tickling was more towards pleasant, but depends on the person. Mm -hmm. And then unpleasant was pain, itch, numb, tingling. Yeah, pain, itch. Itch is another one, yeah. She, for a long time, neurobiologists thought that itch was just sort of a version of mild pain, but it turns out that there are actually different receptors for itch versus pain. Yeah, sure, what else? Uh, sharper, dull sensation. Sharper, dull. So, so what sorts of things are, are, can be sharp versus uh, dull? Pain, while numbing, tends to be like a, a dull mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, pain's interesting. Actually, one of the things that we'll that I'll that I'll sort of put up to tomorrow is um, pain. It can be described as dull. Sometimes people call it like dull, aching, throbbing pain, and then other times like sharp, piercing pain, um, and and sort of different qualities associated with it. Um, but yeah, there's sort of a there's sort of a more more of an ed certainly an edge to pain in the sense that there's not to numbness. Numbness is a sort of very round feeling in a sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and actually, um, you can even go further into like warm versus hot versus like painfully hot and cool versus cold versus painfully cold. Um, and, and there are, it turns out, different sensor, sensors that detect those different things. Yeah. Other, other ideas? Sure, yeah. Did you say that that was a special sensor just for itch? Yes. There actually are dedicated um, sensory nerve endings that are just sensitive to itch. Yeah. Um, and you can, can like um, severe chronic itch can be incredibly debilitating, and people who have um, who have their sensors malfunctioning um, can be um, can can scratch themselves to the point of injury. They it hurts, but it actually hurts less than the itch is annoying, essentially. And so um, there are there are situations where itch is actually like really um, uh, clinically vital sort of issue. Do we know if there's a way to select the People are looking for that, and actually, there's a specific type of um, opioid uh, receptor that's less safe. So, so morphine targets something called mu opioid receptors, um, and then there's another type of opioid receptor called, um, I believe, it's the delta opioid receptor. Um, and delta opioid receptor agonists, unlike morphine, make you feel like crap, but they relieve itch. Um, and so, there's some look at like, well, can we put it on the skin or something like that? Um, okay, so we'll, we'll return to, to touch and pain a little bit more at the beginning of class tomorrow. Um, the last thing that I just wanted to, to mention is, um, again, not to leave you with the impression that, that all science is sort of fan fantasy and that all, um, all, that we know nothing, um, but, um, but rather that there are things that, um, 20 years ago appeared in textbooks as like for sure true that we now know have caveats and um, exceptions to them. Um, and this is also why I'm so passionate about discussing data because the data behind these old outdated theories is still valid. It's just that people didn't look in the right areas of the brain or people didn't um, have the tools to look in the right way to detect things that we now have tools to. Um, and so the data remains um, valid 
uh, but the, the, the theory may need to accommodate new data and new experimental methods. Um, and so a few of them, just to sort of quickly run down, are um, we now know that there are new neurons that are born in the adult brain. We know that there are neurons that release multiple different types of chemical signals. There are um, action potentials that initiate in other parts than what we thought of the neuron, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. There are signals that go back and forth. Signaling is not one way. Um, and, and inputs and outputs also can occur in different places and more places than we thought. Um, so that's sort of all I have for this morning. Um, I, I, again, encourage you have, you have the homework to do tonight as a group. Um, also make sure you have each other's contact information so you can turn it in. To, um, now you should turn in what you already did. Tomorrow you have to turn in a piece of paper. You have to bring with you and turn in a piece of paper with the homework assignment, again, with everybody's name on it. Um, so I will see you all tomorrow morning. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. And just bring those up to the front and turn them in there. Thanks.